Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Thursday, December 7th, 2023 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we prepare for the trading day ahead. Uh, currently, uh, we got futures uh, somewhat mixed. Um, Dow's been down all morning. It is trying to go positive. Let me see if I can give you that. Um, I'll just give you the numbers here real quick. The diamonds right now actually have turned positive. They're up uh, a little less than one-tenth of 1%. The spider is up about one third of 1%. Um, the QQQ, of course, tracking the NASDAQ 100 up about two thirds of 1%. And the IWM, which also was read uh, all morning and overnight. Um, and that one has just turned positive by one penny. So uh, at least uh, futures trying to turn back around. Uh, yesterday, we did see a little bit of selling uh, throughout the day. Still struggling on the S&P 500, trying to get through that 4,600 level. So a lot of that uh, all taking place at this point in time, but uh, we got some more days ahead for the end of the year to try to get back through that 4,600, maybe try to make a run for 4,800. Um, we do have the non-farm payrolls coming out tomorrow, so that's going to be something to keep an eye on and certainly could spark the uh, market. I mean, I look at the jobs report kind of like as the stock market's earnings report. Um, and so if that number if the market likes that number typically we see that most stocks go up if the market doesn't like the number then we see most stocks go down so it's really one report that kind of controls um, a pretty large portion of the uh, stocks that are out there um, i'm going to go ahead and get this thing started so uh, let's just jump into what happened yesterday we saw the dow jones industrial average drop about two tenths of one percent down 70 points uh, closing at 36.054, but we are still above that 36,000 level, which has been holding re uh, recently. S&P 500 down 18 yesterday to 45.49. Uh, you can see we're fairly close to the 4,600 level again earlier in the day, but we've really struggled trying to get through 4,600. And it makes sense. I mean, we had a big move earlier this year. We got up to 4,600 and then we backed off of it and had that three month correction. So now we're all the way back up there trying to get through. I think ultimately we do, but does it happen this week? Uh, not as likely to happen next week just because of the historical bearish tendencies uh, that we generally have second week of uh, December and leading up to the 15th. But what I can tell you is that the December timeframe for stocks is generally very bullish. And most of that bullishness comes after the 15th of the month. So I don't remember the exact numbers. I believe the S&P annualized return for December maybe is somewhere around the 18, 19% area, maybe 17. Um, but the first half of the month is only about 2 or 3%. Second half of the month is more like about 35, 37%. So we definitely have a lot of uh, um, historical bullishness maybe to look forward to. And again, that normally happens after the 15th. So right now, I'll take the S&P 500 treading water. And if we can stay somewhere between the rising 20-day moving average on the S&P, which currently is about 4,507, if we can stay between that 4,500 and 4,600 level for the next seven or eight trading days, I would take that, uh, especially coming off the huge November that we had, the oversold conditions. To me, that would just be like a bull flag. Um, and then potentially could give us some room to launch in the second half of December. We'll see how things play out. NASDAQ 100 uh, yesterday down a little bit more than one half of 1%. Uh, that was down 90 points, back down just below 15,800. Mid caps down about, uh, well, just under two tenths of 1%. <clears throat> Small caps, IWM, same thing, just under two tenths of 1%. So on a relative basis, those were two of the leaders along with the Dow. Transport's down about four-tenths of 1%. So the market was mostly down yesterday, and that was after being in positive territory early in the session. So we did see some selling into the end of the day, which uh, normally I'm not a big fan of, and especially knowing what we have coming up next week. I think we have one more chance, really, to get through 4,600 this week, and it's going to be from the jobs report um, uh, tomorrow. Um, I didn't look to see, actually, let me see if I can get that for you, tell you what the consensus numbers are. Now, remember, the ADP report came out yesterday. It came in just below what the market was expecting. 
I think that is the best case scenario for the non-farm payrolls is to be positive, but maybe at the lower end of consensus estimates, that kind of a thing. Um, last month, so for the month of October, non-farm payrolls were 150,000. This month, we're expecting 180,000. Honestly, if we came in with 150 again, or even 100, 125, that to me would be probably the best case scenario for stocks tomorrow, just because that, again, keeps the Fed on pause. I mean, if you show a really hot um, report, I think in the long term, it might be good. But in the short term, with everyone still keeping their eyes on the Fed, I think if we had a hot report, we'd see that 10-year Treasury yield bounce again in the short term. And it just puts us back on Fed watch, even if only temporarily. Um, and so I don't know that that would get a very good response. I also think a negative jobs report would not get a good response. Um, we haven't had one of those for a while, but I think that would say, hey, maybe our economy is weaker than what the Fed is saying they think it's going to be. And maybe there is that chance for a recession. And anyway, short term, we could see some selling off of that. So I think we have a fairly tight window. I'm going to say somewhere between zero and maybe 175 to 200,000 in terms of jobs is really what I'd like to see come in. We'll see what happens with the number that actually comes in and then how the market reacts to it. But tomorrow is like an earnings report for the entire market. So just keep that in mind. It's always that first Friday in the uh, in each calendar month when we get non-farm payrolls. And that's usually a time where we can see a big move, maybe a big gap up, reversal. Those types of things tend to coincide with the jobs report. So keep that in mind. 10-year uh, treasury yield. Actually, no, I didn't go into, hold on, didn't go into the sectors. Utilities, yesterday, uh, the leader, we've seen that 10-year treasury yield move down. And by the way, when we saw the breakdown on the head and shoulder pattern on the 10-year treasury yield at 455, said the initial measurement was 410. Yesterday, I think we hit 4.108 or something like that as a low. So 4.11% rounded. I'd say we're there at this point. So it wouldn't surprise me if we did see a bounce to the upside. I don't think it'll be a big one. I mean, maybe 20, 25 basis points is what I would think maybe we'll see just because we've had such a steep drop recently. But I also wouldn't be surprised to see it keep going lower. I mean, that's essentially what we've been calling for is that we expect interest rates to go back down into the threes. And then maybe throughout the next year, we kind of meander back and forth from the uh, four or from the threes up to maybe into the fours. I think the top that was set at five is going to be a top, not just for 2024, but I think it could be a very long top. We'll see whether or not that pans out. Um, but I'm expecting more 350 to 450-ish kind of a 10-year treasury yield as we move forward. Um, what else do we have here? Well, energy, crude oil prices dropped. We're down below uh, $70 a barrel yesterday, and that took its toll on energy once again. And you can see energy breaking down. But here's the good news on energy. Notice that PPO much higher as we break down. Now, I wouldn't be one to just jump in front of a freight train here because we did just make a breakdown. But at some point, maybe over the next day, a couple of days, few days, I wouldn't be surprised to see a reversing candle. And with that positive divergence, that could mark at least a short term, maybe an intermediate term bottom on the XLE. So I'll be looking for that. But the XLE did drop. 1.5% uh, yesterday. Technology. Um, Technology is not a huge fan. I mean, some areas do okay in December, but not really great. Not like we usually see in November. And so we're, we're hovering on technology, trying to make a breakout, but so far unable. And uh, technology is the largest sector in the S&P 500. So if you want to see the S&P 500 get through 4,600, we need to see the XLK break above its recent high maybe around that 187 area or so. And uh, I'm just not sure we're going to do that. I don't think we'll do it this week. Um, and just knowing history, probably not next week. I think in the second half of December, I think we have a shot to get back up, maybe take out that level. Furnishings, big day yesterday. They're a part of the consumer discretionary group. Uh, furnishings jumping more than 4%. And you can see already we've had the golden cross, the 20-day crossing above the 50 We've seen a higher high, we've seen a higher low, and now we're breaking out again. I think this is a much, much more bullish um, picture on furnishings now, much more bullish than we've seen probably since back in the summer sometime. So I would not be surprised to see this move, ultimately make it up to about that 350, 360 area, maybe even a little bit higher than that. And we're currently at 328. 
at the close yesterday. So I think there's more room. Watch the 20 day moving average on furnishings to the downside. That would be a level that I would like to see that group hold. Uh, and then in the tr uh, transport area, we had airlines that have really strengthened coming off of that uh, late October low. Uh, group still keeps going up and up. We got down to about 117, I believe it was. I don't remember ex the exact low, um, but we're back up to 144. So this has been a really big move on the airlines here over the last five weeks or so. But look at truckers. Truckers went the other way. Airlines go up 3%. Truckers went down over 3.5%. Um, and as you can see, that actually weighed, ended up weighing on the uh, transportation index. All right, now let's move on to that 10-year treasury yield to get a quick update, see where we are. Right now, 4.144, so 4.14%. Uh, and 4.10 was the target. We had a recent low over here at 4.1. That's a level I'm watching in the near term. Got a lot of room to the upside before we get to that 20-day moving average. So any kind of a bounce in the yield. Might see some folks selling bonds tomorrow, depending on, you know, if we get the jobs report that comes out too hot, uh, we could see rates pop, which means selling in the uh, treasuries. That's a possibility, especially from this level. But I would just watch the overhead resistance at the 20 day, which is at 4365 right now. So 4365, 4.36, 4.37, which is what I talked about earlier. That would be the area that I think we could possibly see the 10 year treasury yield go up to and still remain in this downtrend. All right, moving on to the S&P 500. Actually, um, with that 10 year treasury yield, I always like to look at the uh, economic reports that came out so far this morning. Um, we did get the initial jobless claims. Of course, that's out every Thursday morning. And they came in right about as expected, 220,000 versus the 220,000 expected. Last week was revised slightly higher from 218 to 219. So we're right in that ballpark, still fairly low number for initial jobless claims. And that that's one of the reasons why for me, I don't, I'd be really surprised if we saw negative uh, jobs report tomorrow. I don't see that happening, but it would be nice to come in somewhere around the 100, 175, somewhere in that area, I think would be best for stocks in the short term. Um, all right, let's move back over here to the S&P 500. Yeah, I mean, that candle right there, not great. We didn't take out the high, so we, it's not like we had a false breakout. One thing that maybe watch for between today and tomorrow, if we get a move up, and especially tomorrow with the non-farm payrolls, if we get a move up and we get through 4,600 intraday, 4,605, 4,610, 4,620, I don't know, and then come down in the afternoon and we leave a tail up above this breakout area, knowing what we know about next week, historically, I would be much more cautious, probably just for a week or so, but I would not, I definitely would not have any leverage. I probably won't have any leverage anyway, um, heading into next week, but um, I would definitely be out of leverage. I mean, you even could have some cash, you know, if you're bullish, if, I'm talking about traders, by the way, don't misinterpret them. If you're long-term buy and hold, I love the market. I think we're going higher. I wouldn't change a thing. But if you're somebody that, hey, if you think the S&P 500 might drop 100 points as a short-term trader, probably going to mean some losses in your account that you're not going to really want to see. So tomorrow, if we get that breakout and then we fail on the breakout um, and you can see that PPO is rolling over, that would be a little bit of a warning sign for me for at least the next week or at least until we show we can break out above 4,600 and hold it into a close. So that's going to be an interesting, this will be a very interesting chart to watch. It's always an interesting chart to watch. I, the S&P is my benchmark, so I'm constantly looking at it. But just pay attention to tomorrow's intraday or even today maybe um, if we get a, a big day. Intraday moves above 4,600 with failures to close there based on this pattern, I think would be a short-term sell. Um, so just watch that. Um, NDX, NASDAQ 100. Our, we, we tried to bounce yesterday off the 20-day. We had a big gap up, but you can see mostly selling throughout the day. Um, this is a group, you know, technologies run quite a bit. And of course, that's the primary leader in the NASDAQ 100. It's okay if they pause for a little bit. You know, of course, bears will get all excited because market pulls back for a little bit. Don't worry about it. Um, at least I wouldn't be worrying about it. I won't be worrying about it. But if I can avoid my 
account going down with it, I got more purchasing power when it finally and ultimately reverses back to the upside. So again, this is another index I'll watch for potential false breakout. If we have a false breakout, we already had a kind of a false breakout with the PPO rolling over. But if we were to get another one, get back up above, say, 16.1, maybe even touch 16.2 and then fail with that PPO pointing down like that, that would be reason to be cautious in the near term. IWM, uh, this is probably the best looking index still. And we had a false breakout yesterday, but it's been going straight up. It's still quite a ways away from its 20 day moving average. Unlike what I just showed you on the NDX, I mean, we just tested the 20 day. The S&P hasn't gotten down there, but we're a little closer on the S&P, about 1% than we are on the IWM, which is probably closer to maybe two, maybe almost 3%, two to 3%. So just this has got a little bit of room to the downside. I'm okay with it pulling back. I'd like to see it hold on a closing basis, 179 to 180 on any pullback, not just not just talking about this week or whatever, I'm talking about going forward, even next week. Really like to see that IWM hold the 20 day. And when I see a PPO that at its most recent high, high close, because the PPO is based on closing prices. So I'm not looking too much of where the PPO is uh, with an intraday move. But where was the PPO on the last candle body high, which is opens and closes? Um, and that, you can see the PPO continues to go higher. So what, what it's telling me, what the signal's telling me is just that our momentum is accelerating to the upside. So we've got really good bullish momentum on the IWM, which means if we pull back and hit the 20 day moving average, I am absolutely expecting it to bounce. Um, that 20 day test would be where I would be probably my most heavily leveraged, whatever most heavily means if you leverage. And I would just say, if you don't leverage or you don't know what it is, probably best just to stay away from it. If you are not a risk taker, you really consider yourself to be more, you know, um, um, you know, just more close to the vest. You know, you want to keep things fairly safe. Um, I would just completely ignore leverage altogether. Just there's no point in it. But if you're more aggressive and when the market goes up, you want to try to juice your returns. Leverage can be a good thing, but the key is you got to be willing to take that risk. Now, close, the reason I like it down near the 20 days, because if it goes through the 20 day, I'm getting out of leverage. So if I can get it close to the 20 day and the 20 day holds and we go back up, leverage works great. If it doesn't hold and we go back down, we can get out without getting crushed by having leverage. I mean, the problem is when you chase and then you come back down, you're already down quite a bit when you get to the 20 day. And so things start happening in your mind and you think, oh, well, if I go down a little bit below the 20, it's okay. I'll wait to see if I get a reversal. Next thing you know, you're down at 176. And you're saying, well, there's gap support here at 175 and change or actually 174 and change. I'll hold till there. And then you go a little bit below that. You hit the 50 day and you're like, well, I might as well make sure, see if it hits the 50 day, go below that. And then you're looking at this next gap support telling you it gets to you when you've got a lot of leverage uh, on the table and you're starting to see your losses mount. It's almost like you're trying to get back at the market and that is a bad, bad spot to be in uh, when you're trading. So that's why I like leverage closer to support or on a breakout. Um, and then I can always decide if it doesn't hold the breakout, I can get out if I'm close to the 20 day moving average, so forth. Anyway, don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I do get a lot of questions about leverage and how I use it. Um, and so just want to make sure everybody at least understands where I'm coming from. But again, I tend to take more risks than probably most people. So I wouldn't be trying to mirror, um, you know, necessarily what I do. And I'm not a registered investment advisor. I always like to point that out. So I'm not licensed to provide advice and recommendations. So I don't like those two words. I get a lot of questions. What advice would you give me? And I'm like, I can't give you advice. I can tell you what I think of the chart and I can tell you why I think it. And I can explain the PPO and negative divergences. I can do everything educational. I mean, I'm fine with that. I can't give advice. I can't give recommendations. And so just want to make sure everyone's always clear on that. Let's move on to the chart of the day. First of all, thanks. Uh, we did close out our, our fall special. I want to thank everybody that uh, participated in that and supported us. Um, it was a great turnout. Um, and so again, just want to thank all of you 
um, that did either become a member or maybe extended using the special. It's our best. It was our best deal of the year. And so I'm glad so many folks were able to uh, take advantage of that. Um, as far as the chart of the day goes, if you're new to earnings beats and you're still trying to figure out this whole investing thing and you want somebody who is, tries to be objective, I know there's some of you out there that say, you know, you're just a perma bull. I am not a perma bull. I'm mostly a bull because the stock market tells me to be mostly a bull. Look at a long-term chart to tell me why you'd want to be a long-term bear. Makes no sense. But if I see my warning signs, I've got plenty of things I can show either through my my uh, communication with members, um, my YouTube videos that we do, you know, the shows that I do. Um, I write articles over at Stock Charts, plenty of articles. I can point out multiple, many times over the last five years where I've been bearish. I was bearish first six months of 2022. Even when we were rallying, I said, don't trust this rally. So I don't mind being on the other side when it need, when I need to be there. I'm not going to be there because I'm afraid of every CNBC news article that comes out or I don't even watch CNBC, but I don't care about the media. I don't care about what everyone else is saying about the market because I get those questions too. But what do you think about this person that just said this? You know, Jeremy Grantham just said this. Well, Jeremy Grantham's perma bear. Peter Schiff, please don't even bring up Peter Schiff. Someone actually mentioned that I saw in the um, in the comments yesterday. I think I was talking about if anybody's called the market better than earnings beats, you know, let me know because I honestly, I would like to follow them. I like folks that will go, you know, that will look at a market and say, hey, we're in good shape or hey, got to be a little careful here because of this. I I have respect for those folks and I'd be interested in following them. Um, but the ones that are always bullish or always bearish, cast them aside. They're going to they're gonna take you down the wrong road. Now, if I had to pick, I'd go with the ones that are always bullish because the market's more bullish than it is bearish. But um, yeah, I just, anyway, the comment that was in the section uh, yesterday um, asked me if Peter Schiff was one of the, uh, if, if he was one of the people that had, I guess, you know, had some great forecasts or whatever. If you don't know Peter Schiff, he is on CNBC all the time, paraded as some kind of an expert. I have never seen him ever that I can ever recall saying, I think U.S. equities look good here. I have never seen it. If you if you have a clip, send it to me. I mean, I'd love to love to see that. Um, you know, and then you'd have to convince me it's not like a, a double, a Peter Schiff double, somebody's, you know, taking on his persona or something. But anyway, um, he's always bearish, always talking about the next crash. Um, I, I can't even take, I mean, I lose all respect because they say it all the time. And then he, he comes on to CNBC and they're like, oh, he called the 2007 market crash, you know, through 2009. And he called the dot-com bubble and he called the trade war. And he called, well, of course he did, because he said it, every time you see him, he says it's going down. So when it goes down, he called it. What about the other 480,000 times he's been paraded around and got it wrong? Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Anyway, I digress. Um, it actually, to me, is a little humorous at this point. Uh, moving on to that chart of the day, though. Oh, I didn't uh, show you how you can sign up. So if you are new to Earnings Beats, just go over to EarningsBeats.com, scroll down, name and email address, all it takes. We'll get you out our chart of the day on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, normally by 8.30. Um, I'm not always on time, um, so sometimes it's a little bit later. But usually I, I, we do try to get it out by about 8.30, 9 o'clock before the market opens, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I talk about the things that are important to us at Earnings Beats. It's relative strength. It's price volume. It's candlesticks. It's sentiment. It's uh, intermarket relationships. All those things really important to us. So anyway, sign up. There's no credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. It's completely free. Not going to hurt my feelings if you unsubscribe. Um, we literally have tens of thousands uh, subscribers. Um, this is a popular newsletter. It's a very quick read. Every When it comes out, it's two paragraphs in a chart. So you're going to learn a little bit about charting. Uh, you'll learn. I'll give you a couple paragraphs, why I like the chart, don't like the chart, watching the chart, whatever. I think it's a, a good educational piece to just add to your to your repertoire. Chart of the day for today. Um, I wanted to pull up first solar. Um, now, first of all, you see that big reversal with that long tail? We have 
well, it would have been a really shallow right shoulder, but you're coming down, potentially putting in a left shoulder, neckline, head, right side of the neckline that's slightly upsloping, which I like because you move actually a little bit above that prior um, high. So all of a sudden, your series of lower lows and lower highs is now changing. So that's the beauty of a, a bottoming or reversing head and shoulder pattern is that it does the opposite of what it does at the top. At the top, we look for a reversal. And when we break and execute it, we look for lower prices just like or, or lower yields, like I talked about with the 10-year treasury yield. In the case of First Solar, this was looking like a possible bottoming, reversing head and shoulder pattern, where if we could get through about 160, 161, that would kind of be that breakout, that confirmation uh, that the pattern had executed. And then we could start looking at higher prices for measurements. Well, look at what happened here. We failed. Now, I, you know, if I just only looked at the daily chart, I'd say, okay, well, we failed. Maybe we're going to go back down to the 20-day moving average. And then we're going to bounce back up again. Obviously, you can see yesterday, that would not have been a very good call, right? So what I want to stress here is sometimes it's a good idea when you're looking at the daily chart, go out a little bit further and take a look at the weekly chart. Go back maybe five years and see how this daily chart is lining up on the weekly chart. And if you did that, you wouldn't have been buying at any point over here. Let me show you why. So on a weekly chart, here was a breakdown. First of all, we're going up, 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 lower PPO, negative divergences on the long-term weekly chart, which to me means a 50-week test. Also, if you notice, we had broken out here right around 180. And notice these lows that came down were right around 170 to 180 intraweek, closing right around that 180 level. And so this move back down to the 50-week moving average is what I should have expected. And then I would have been like, okay, are we going to bounce? That would have been, I would have said probably 70% chance we would have bounced and maybe a 30% chance that we'd go through to the downside. Well, we now know we went through. And guess what? When we had that false breakout above the price action on the daily chart, which I'll pull up right here, see that false breakout and the failure? Well, if you had looked at the weekly chart, you would see a similar failure on the falling 20 day, or excuse me, 20 week EMA. So you had a false breakout and a reversal right at the area where you would normally see it on a weekly chart. I mean, you know, if you're going up, you're looking for that rising 20 week moving average to hold as support, which it did. Um, when you go down below, you tend to have struggles at that 20 week uh, moving average. Here you go up. Every time we pull back, what are we holding? Basically the 20 week moving average. We had a little bit of weakness here, held price support, went just a little below the 20 day and then came back up for one final high. And then back down, we went to the 50 and then ultimately break down. You've got to assume from a longer term perspective, until it proves otherwise, you've got to assume it's failing at that 20 week moving average. At the last low, PPO was at its low. So that tells me on that last low, momentum, selling momentum was accelerating. So when you get a bounce, you've got to expect that that 20 week moving average is not going to be taken out. Um, now we are in a bull market. so. I would respect it if it did break out, but I'd have to see it first. So again, that's just a way to combine daily chart, weekly chart. Sometimes what you're seeing on the daily chart is maybe a little bit of an illusion. You know, just kind of short term, you're getting that move up. You think you got a breakout. It turns out to be a false breakout. You look at the weekly chart. It's like, wow, this is an area I really want to be careful on the weekly chart. No trade. Anyway, thought that was a good illustration of that. Why did I pull Apple up? I have no idea why I pulled Apple up. Um, Apple did make a little short-term breakout here. AD line still looks good. I think Apple eventually this year goes up and challenges this 197 and a half area. I think the uh, closing high around 196, uh, that area definitely gets challenged. I wouldn't be surprised maybe if we break out above it before the end of the year. We'll see. Um, short-term, however, don't have, let's uh, look at this. This could be a negative divergence on Apple. Probably is. Yeah, the breakout right here, if it fails to hold the breakout, so if, it, if you see it back down around 192, 191, that to me would be maybe failing to hold that breakout with a negative divergence. Probably want to be a little careful. 
Um, all right, couple of uh, earnings reports out this morning and, and yesterday after the close. Wanted to talk about one in particular. Um, this is VEEV, this is Viva Systems. It's a software company. You can see the big sell-off and then this huge gap down. Notice there, false breakout above this uh, key resistance. This is the bottom of gap resistance. So whenever we have a move on a stock that's going up and it gaps up, I always talk about it coming down, testing the top of the gap um, support. Here, this is testing the bottom of gap resistance. It's going the other way. Notice how we keep failing right here around this 179 area. Yesterday, looked like we had a breakout above the 20-day moving average. Probably some technicians jumping in, maybe thinking that Vivo is going to have a big report. It failed, came back down. This is not the setup I would be looking for heading into an earnings report. And Viv, when I pulled this up right before the show, you can see it was down 2.83%. Don't know where it is right now, but I'll give you an update on the chart. And let's see what's going on. I mean, look at that. Um, now, my guess is we go back down to this 165 level. If we put in a false breakdown back here and you're a value, you know, you're somebody looking maybe, not that it's really a great value stock because it doesn't pay dividends, I don't believe. But if you're just looking for, you know, if you want to be more of a bottom fisher, um, a false breakdown at 165 might be worth a shot. But if that breaks down, I'd be right back out. Uh, I wouldn't take any chances. Um, but there you go. I mean, we get right back up, have a false breakout. And I know a lot of folks say, well, look at it. It's gapping up. It's getting through the 20-day. Somebody knows something. That's always, I always love hearing that. Somebody knows something. Well, it's a quiet period. So if if they know something, it has to be from probably at least a few, several weeks ago, maybe four or five weeks ago. Um, so anyway, I don't pay any attention to that. I simply look at the charts. I don't like what I'm seeing here. And and Viva actually beat, I think. Yeah, they beat 134 versus 128. And yet, gap back down and currently down 5.6%. So that have been a painful lesson jumping in yesterday when it was breaking out above that 20-day. All right. Um, that is basically it for me. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, what's going on in the market. We do have some decent action going on here. Got the Dow up uh, about 0.15%, S&P up a half of 1%, 45.73. Remember, 4,600 is level we're watching. Still got non-farm payrolls tomorrow. NASDAQ up um, eight, almost you know between eight and nine tenths of 1%. Small caps up a little bit lesser, but they're green. Uh, VIX is up today with the market being up. That's always interesting. It's one of the things I look for over a little bit longer period because that can mean um, a couple of things, but certainly could mean a reversal in the trend. Now, right now, I don't even think we're trending. We're kind of just hovering on the S&P just below 4,600, but we are coming off of a pretty steep uptrend. So anytime, if, if the S&P keeps going up and maybe gets through 4,600 intraday, and you see the VIX start creeping up to 13 and a half, 13.75. That could be a little bit of a warning sign, especially if we get a false breakout. So anyway, I'm going to leave it on that note. Uh, I will not be back until Tuesday of next week for your next uh, Trading Places Live. Continue to promote our show, please. It really helps us. So if you can let others know about it, hit that like button, um, subscribe. Um, love to have you know others. Uh, able to come in, listen to us, at least get our perspective on the market. Um, listen to something other than CBC, CNBC. Anyway, have a great day, everybody. Appreciate your support. And again, thanks for all of you that did uh, come on board or extend with our fall special. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. See you next week.